I've just come to these last few verses of Ecclesiastes. We've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, the writer says here, the conclusion of the matter. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 9. Not only was the teacher wise, but also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads or like rods. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study wearies the body. Now, that's true, I tell you. Much study wearies the body. Now, all has been heard. And here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man and woman. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And as you know, and I know, this, this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. Now, I read in Daily Bread, our Daily Bread, uh, that a man called John was driving home late one night when he picked up a hitchhiker. As they rode along, he began to be suspicious of, of his passenger. And John checked to see if his wallet was safe in the pocket of his coat that was in the seat between them. But it wasn't there. So he slammed on the brakes, ordered the hitchhiker out, and said, hand over the wallet immediately. The frightened hitchhiker handed over a billfold, and John drove off. When he arrived home, he started to tell his wife about the experience, but she interrupted him, saying, before I forget, John, do you know that you left your wallet at home this morning? See, on our journey, journey home, or our journey through life, we make wrong assumptions. We can get wrong assumptions and we find ourselves in trouble. So don't just assume that life as you know it, as I know it, is meaningless. For real living is all about recognizing the one who the writer says is creator, shepherd, judge. How would I, how would you sum up your life or life to this point, where you are at this moment? Have we, like the teacher, began to re begun to recognize that meaning begins and ends with God? And William Barclay said this, that the Christian hope is the hope which has seen everything, endured everything, and has still not despaired because it believes in God. The Christian hope is not hope in the human spirit, in human goodness, in human endurance, in human achievement. The Christian hope is hope in the power of God. Now, as you read Ecclesiastes, it's, it's one of the saddest books. Although you can trace some pleasant parts of it, it's sad. The sad thing is that when you discover the end or conclusion of your life, where we should have begun, it's only at the end we look back and see the faults and the mistakes. So these aren't words that we read today that bring much comfort. But they are very honest words. I want to leave you with four things that I find in this chapter, or these few verses. And the first title is, How About Some Answers? Some Answers. This man, his teacher, or a Solomon, or one of his descendants, tried to discover what, what life was all about by seeking answers in three different areas. In himself, in other people, by looking, listening in God as he turned his eyes upward. He was determined to find answers to the meaning of life and what it meant for him. And he studied it with his mind, the scripture tells us. He had great wisdom and knowledge. 
But he discovered no answers. He looked at it with his heart, which is the seat of emotions, and he searched for happiness in wine and women and song. But he didn't get answers. He sought it with his will and dedicated himself to achieving greatness and sought to be remembered for what he built and for what he achieved. But no answers. And verses 9 and 10 tells us his knowledge came through discovery. He kept looking, and although a lot of what he discovered often led him to lose hope, but he still kept asking, why am I here? What is the meaning of life? What is life all about? There must be more than this. There's a higher purpose, surely, than what I've achieved and what I've got. So, we look at that, how about some answers, and we find he's looking for answers. But then he moves on, and, and we ask, how about some wisdom? James Parker, in the little book, Knowing God, if you've never read that, get a hold of it. He says this, Wisdom is the power to see, and the inclination to choose the best and highest goal, together with the surest means of attaining it. See, wisdom is given by God in response to our asking. James 1.5 says, If any of you, me, any of us, lack wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. That's a promise. Ask wisdom, God will give you that wisdom. See, Solomon, if this was Solomon, had been given wisdom, and he had learned to apply it to life. He knows God is the source of wisdom. So he often turned to what God said rather than what other people said. He wanted to learn, and then he wanted to impart that learning to others. But it involved him in being persistent, patient, taking time out to fully prepare himself, and so with us. See, the authority of God's word and God's will will be seen and clearly recognized by us as God is introduced into a life. So he's a man, and he's saying, what about some wisdom? What about this wisdom I have? And we are asking, how can we, and the Bible says, you can ask of God and get that wisdom. So verse 9, we read these words. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. So he looked at God's word, he pondered it, he paid close attention to it before he taught others. See, that's so important as a preacher, teacher, um, Sunday school teacher, youth leader, whatever, that God teaches you first before you teach other people. It doesn't matter whether you're an elder, deacon, pastor, it doesn't matter. God needs to teach you first. When we were at Spurgeon's, when I was at Spurgeon's as a student, seems a long time ago now, but they always told us, as you stand up to preach, it's all very well having a sermon prepared, but the man has to be prepared. I have to be prepared on my knees before God, asking him to help me be the man, present the message, but his message, not, I can't, God cannot use me if I am not right with him. And God asks us to come and allow him to work in our lives before we teach others. So he paid close attention to God's word. See, life is a matter of building. Each of us have the opportunity to build something with what God has given us. It might be a secure family, it might be a good reputation, it might be a career, it might be, and more importantly, a relationship to God. How is, how is my relationship to God? See, a lot of these other things can disappear overnight due to financial losses or natural disasters and other unforeseen difficulties, but not a relationship with God. And what are we to do then? Now, verse 9 tells us it's time. It's time for each of us. And those who are listening and reading what Solomon or the teacher is saying, it's time to get it right. 
to find the right words. And he does that in verse 10. Those words, to acknowledge those words, he says in verse 10, the teacher searched to find just the right words. And what he wrote was upright and true. He tells us to go to the one who can give us the answers. And he says in verse 11, the real authority comes from the shepherd. Now Pamela Reeve says, faith is realizing that I am useful to God, not in spite of my scars, but because of them. You've all, we've all had experiences in life and there's been hurts, sometimes disasters and distresses. But you know, these are allowed in God's grace for a purpose. There are things that I've, I've experienced in my life that I've been able to help others who are going through similar circumstances. How can I tell somebody about, it's okay, I understand. You don't understand unless you've been through it. And if you've been through it, then you can lay a hand on somebody else. You can encourage somebody else because you can say, not only can I bring God's word to you, but I can bring you my experience. I've been there. And I walked through the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. The Holy Spirit has the power, and I've seen that, and you've seen it, to change people's lives, as well as direct them in the right way. Now, I just happened to know a cake was out there, and I've just got this same verse down here, Proverbs 3, 5, 6, and it's written on that cake, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what? He will direct your path. There's a promise. God's promise to you, to me. Someone has said this, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Nobody lives long enough to make them all himself. How true that is? See, as others make mistakes, you make sure you learn from these mistakes. And you'll be a wiser man and a wiser woman. Now here's a man in verse 12. He's writing and he's keeping and he's studying books. And he becomes so weary with it. And he tells you, you know, the, 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 the studying can make you so weary. And he also mentions that it's so easy to accumulate books but never learn anything. And his search is frustrated, and it wearied him. And as he looked at others and their circumstances, he still couldn't discover an absolute answer to what was going on in his life and in the lives of others. I read of a minister who was visiting one of his members. The lady of the house was trying to impress him. Now, that happens, and pastors often visit, about how devout, devout she was. She pointing to out the large Bible on the bookshelf, talking in a very reverential, reverential way about the Word of God. And then her young son, as only children can do, interrupted the conversation. Well, if that is God's Word, we better send it back to him because we never read it. Your children, your children are observing you. My children are observing me, us. What do they say? Do you ever think when they go off to school, you wonder what they tell the teacher? What they tell them? I often thought about that. Especially if I lost it with them, had the time to say, sorry, and I just wonder what they were going to tell the teacher. It really grieved me. I, I put my arms around them quickly when they came back and said, oh, I'm so sorry. Not so much because of what they said to the teacher, but because I know I was wrong. As a Jew, Solomon believed there was a God, but hadn't really carefully thought through the impact it should have in all of his life. He believed there was a God. And so, we need wisdom. I ask a third question. Have we got lost? Have we, we lost our way? Have we lost our focus? See, the shepherd that he mentions here is looking for you this morning. Now, Isaiah says, Isaiah 55, 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we, just like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own or her own way. Leith Anderson, 
who pastors one of the biggest, or pastored one of the biggest churches in, in Minneapolis, said in a book, The Lord is My Shepherd. A shepherd notches the ear of a lamb born to his flock and has then rightful ownership. The lamb then, if walks deliberately away from him, and the shepherd searches far and near, cannot find to get that lamb back. Cannot find it. A long time later, he finds not a baby lamb, but a grown sheep for sale at the animal auction. The shepherd recognizes what? The mark, his mark on that sheep's ear. And he goes to the auctioneer and says, I can see the mark. The sheep is mine. The auctioneer says, listen, you must bid and pay an outrageous price far above any reasonable market value in order to get your lamb. He now has, and he does that. And he now has double right to own his sheep from birth through redemption. From birth and redemption. See, God has a right to own us as creator. But because he's paid by his blood, the blood of his own son, an outrageous price far above our market value, in order what? To redeem us back again. Do you acknowledge this morning, not only that you are created, but God has sent his only son to die for you. And he longs that you come to him and accept his death, his burial, his glorious bodily resurrection. Accept what he did on that cross for you. And acknowledge him as your saviour and your Lord. And so we as Christians are called to be total, whole human beings. And that involves giving our total life to him. See, we're instructed by God to recognize not only his relevance. It's easy to recognize God's relevance. Oh, God, yes. But do you recognize his reality? My mother, your scholarly mother, used to say in Scotland over and over again, my God is real. My God is real. My God is real. And when we wanted to do our own thing, she would tell us, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. There is meaning to life. To this life, and our calling is to serve him in the time allotted to us. Do you know how much time you've got? Whatever age you are. Can you just stand up and tell me how much time you've got? None of us know. The next breath could be a last. We do not know. But we have time allotted to us. Really enjoy life. There is meaning. There is a calling. And our calling is to serve in the time allotted to us. We are in transition as we travel through this life. And Solomon here, the writer and the teacher, wants us to realize that death is a reality. So give God our best years. That's what he's saying. I read of a story of a man who came rushing up to a ferry breathless after running at a terrific pace. But he got there just as the gateman shut the door in his face. That's happened to me at an airline. I've been told that the plane is waiting. Get there. Just got there. The door closes. A bystander remarked, you didn't run fast enough. The disappointed man answered, I ran fast enough, but I didn't start on time. Some of you are running fast. Some of you are facing a door that is closed. And someday it will be closed for all eternity. Are you willing to start? What does the Bible say? I can't remember. Just 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is God's day of salvation. See, I believe that many of us don't take God seriously enough until some tragedy strikes or we face God in judgment in some way, whether on this earth, definitely on the life to come. Our world society has endless opinions and knowledge and philosophies how we should live, what we should do, how we should behave. The best health portion to take today, the best best exercise to do tomorrow. They've got all the answers. But does it satisfy? Does it give meaning? Does it give hope? And this, this philosopher, this teacher, this preacher, 
is looking, looking for the right word for reaching an individual, for reaching you and me, for reaching an audience, for reaching a congregation of people. For here is a wise man who's read many, many books, but he shares what he learns with others. How relevant or wise is your teaching? How relevant or wise is my teaching to my children, to my friends, to those I teach? The Bible says here, the secret of being a whole person is what? Verse 13. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Now, that word fear in the Hebrew has two ideas. The idea of reverence and the idea of trust. You reverence God and you trust him. That's, that's the word fear. And God is calling us, asking us to reverence him, but to trust him and keep his commandments, to obey him. We don't like to obey. Now, if you've got a dog, it doesn't like to obey him either. Definitely not a cat. A cat will never obey you. <laughs> Sorry for those who have cats. I've had many cats, but a cat likes to control but we need to teach them, the dogs, the people. The, and we are just like dogs, just like animals at times. We, we're all dressed up in our, our best. Some of you might just wonder why I need to get in any particular outfit if I'm working a particular job. But you were expected to do that. But see, God's more important not on what's going on outside. He's more concerned with what's going on inside. I, 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 I don't find this easy to preach in this last time. You know, I've done it many times with other churches. But you know, I want you to, to get a hold of this fact that God cares for you. God loves you. Whatever you're going to experience, don't say God's outside. God's there with you. In fact, if you're a Christian, God's living inside you, in your home, in your life, in your very temple, which is your body. He loves you. But he wants you, he wants me to understand, to realize that I need to love him with my, all my heart. And also love my neighbor as myself. He says with regard to this in Matthew 2, Matthew um, 20, I just don't have the exact quote, but Matthew 2, I think, 37 to 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And this is my life verse, one of them. What does the Lord your God require of you, of me? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, walk humbly with your God. So how about the answers? He's, he's trying to give us answers. How, how about wisdom? Oh, ask God and get this wisdom. How, how, have we got lost? Have we lost our focus on what life is all about? We, we've got clouded vision. But then we get to the end, right at the end. Have we got what purpose? He concludes that God has a purpose. He knows, God knows why he's put us on this planet, planet Earth. If I'm just a chance combination of chemicals or, or of water, a flash of lightning, then life is really then empty and worthless. But God has a plan for your life, for my life, for your family, for my family, for your career, for my career. God has a plan. Sam Shoemaker says, if the whole scheme of life is not a scheme at all but a chaos, if there is no thread of purpose running through it all but only confusion, then our misfortunes are just part of the general mess. But if God is, and if life is his creation, with meaning in the middle of it, then we may hope to discover a pattern which will both give coherence to all and in all and help to interpret it, interpret any one event in the unfoldment. You know what saddens me? I read, uh, I think it was um, a newspaper uh, some years ago. And I was reading about this Nobel Peace Prize winner. And it was for science, as a matter of fact, for the study of the stars and the planets and everything else. And, I, and he was talking about his journey. 
And he talked about how he recognized a designer. He says, there must be a, a, a personal God because it's, 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 just, it's just such a beautiful, beautiful creation. I say to my fellow scientists, and they poo-poo it. Even though I'm, I'm one of the, the top scientists in the world, they poo-pooed it. But he says, I haven't come to the point of recognizing that he is my personal savior. He can see it. He can recognize it. He can explore it. But he's never allowed this God to come into his life. I remember another scientist who discovered DNA. And um, his name's not coming to me right away. But I remember, and I shared with somebody this week, in the study of the, the DNA, uh, and, uh, and he, he said this, I was walking in the hills, and I met Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I saw it in the DNA of people. I saw it in, in my research. And he again was one of the top scientists in the world. One who recognized and saw the creation, but not only that, he was his asked them to be his personal Lord and Savior. And the other saw it all, but it just didn't come to the point where he said, Jesus for me. That's what I want. I don't want you to have head knowledge. I don't even want you to know this Bible cover to cover. The devil knows this book better than you know, or me, or anybody. He knows this book. But his, he's going to land in hell. In fact, worse than that, he's going to the lake of fire. We don't like to talk about that sometimes. But you know, there's a heaven to gain. There's a hell to shun. Have you given God some time? Have you got purpose? For many research, uh, just restrict the research to, to under the sun as this writer. But he wants us to go with it beyond that. The closing thought in verse 14 Reminds them that, that we can't hide from God. Remember what he said to Adam and Eve? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And he was talking about two who had just sinned. And this morning, I don't know, but God knows everyone here. He's, he knows every thought here. He knows those who are thinking it's time this preacher was finished. Let's get to the goodies outside. No, he's knowing every thought. And he wants you to know that he, he loves you. He loves you. He's aware of you. He knows what's happening in your life and your experience. And he wants you to know that he's walking towards you. Because we love, he's lost fellowship with you. And he says, trust God, fear God. Come under his authority. And the purpose of life is to know the one and only true God. So with the final word here is, get under his authority, that he's saying. And only through Jesus Christ can we really know God. Not here, that's good, but here. Many have it here, it's never moved here. God desires that we are living the Christian life through what's taking place here. Ecclesiastes 3.11 said, he has made everything beautiful. That word beautiful is appropriate in its time. He set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So as we graviate towards God, the quicker he'll come into focus. And the quicker we'll head in the right direction. Isn't it Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. God wants you this morning as I close to know that he has a future in store for you and he wants it to be with him. He desires, Christian friend, that you enter into the inheritance that awaits you in Christ for we are then joint heirs with him. I read, you may perhaps heard of Ravi Zacharias he relates how he went to Vietnam during the Vietnam War. He went to minister to the soldiers. And his interpreter was a young man, age 17. And he lost touch with this young man until one day, about 17 years later, 
this man contacted him from California. And Ravi asked him how he was getting on and how he got to the USA. And then he said to Ravi Zacharias, have you got time to listen? He says, yes, I've got time, definitely. He says, when the Americans left, he was rounded up and he was thrown into prison. Every day he was beaten by the Viet Cong and his life was threatened. Brainwashed and beaten, they tried to make him deny his faith. And one day he got to the end of his resources and made, his, made up his mind next, next morning to stop praying. Because it hadn't helped him, so he thought. And next day he was cleaning filthy latrines when he saw a piece of paper in English. Usually they were in Vietnamese or French, so he was curious. He cleaned it, he folded it and placed it in the back pocket. Later, when the prisoners were asleep, he got out and he read. He shone a light on it and he saw these words, Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And the man wept. From that day, he noticed other pages and discovered that the commanding officer was using the pages of a Bible as toilet paper, personal toilet paper. And so he collected them, cleaned them, and put them together. And God was ministering to his soul. One day he and others had planned to escape when he was approached by the guards. And they asked him if he was planning to escape. And he said, oh, no, 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 I'm not. Uh, and then afterwards he was overcome with guilt that he'd taken matters into his own hands rather than trusting God. He confessed his sin and said, Lord, if you send these soldiers back, if you want to do that, I'll tell them the truth. And just before the escape was about to take place, the, here comes the, the prison guards, four of them. And he said to them, and they said to him, are you planning to escape? And he said, yes. Committing the outcome to God. They then responded, we're going with you. We want to come too. And they set sail into rough waters and the boat would lightly capsized. But these soldiers, these four soldiers, knew how to navigate through dangerous waters. They then arrived in Thailand and from there he came to America and he went to Berkeley University, got his degree, then an MBA, and then he called Ravi Zacharias. And he's now ministering the word in the west coast of the USA. Don't discount what God can do in your circumstances. So how about some answers? God has the answers. Christ. How about some wisdom? God says, ask me, I'll give it you. Have we got lost? Is our focus not so bright and clear because of circumstances, because of others? And lastly, have we got purpose? Are you sitting in this congregation this morning you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Or you're sitting here, you look as if you're a good Christian? Only God knows. You know, a verse that really pains me is the pain of seeing preachers. Jesus says there were preachers and healers and men who have done much in my name stand before me. And I'll say, I never knew you. Depart into a lost eternity. My concern, friend, is not that I know him, but that he knows me. And what does it say, Jesus says as a shepherd? My sheep know my voice and follow me. Do you know his voice this morning? Does he know you as his sheep? Has he put his stamp on you that you're recognizable? It's quite a question. I don't want to be in that group, standing before the Lord on Judgment Day. And, and I said, Lord, but I did this in your name, and I did that, and I was this, and I was that. He said, Depart from me. I never knew you. Get beyond head knowledge. Have a personal, dynamic, transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. And as a pastor, you know, we can tell stories about people who have moved from darkness to light, and the transformation is tremendous. I can also tell you about people, one lady comes into my mind right now, sitting in church, 40 years she had been in that church, was a member, 
Everything was right. One day she came to me and said, I don't really know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I had the joy of baptizing my, an older lady. How do you sum up your life today? The dying man I went to visit in Poole Dorset asked to tell him and share him the gospel and all he could say as he lay dying was these words, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. That's all he could say. Then there was Thelma. She'd just been diagnosed with cancer. I didn't know that. A woman in her 30s, quite high up in the health education. And she was, just, she was the superintendent of the Sunday school. And she just happened to be passing at the back. And over the mic she heard these words. Do you want to be healed? That happened to be the text I was preaching. But she only got hold of that. Do you want to be healed? She asked me to come and I prayed with her. She shared. I cut a long story short. She was tremendously healed. And she went to Romania to use her life in ministering to the orphanages and these dear young kids. So, have we got purpose in our life? And I just, this is one thing that just came into my mind, was we can sing the hymns too, and we enjoy I, these hymns I chose, we chose just lovely hymns. But in Chelmsford, in a very large church, I was preaching in Chelmsford, Chelmsford in Essex. And a man came to me afterwards and he said, I've sung this hymn many, many times, but I've never sung it and known it as personal to me. Now you can sing all these hymns, I can sing the hymns, but do they mean something? Do they mean something? So I leave you with that. It's the summing up at the end of Ecclesiastes. I want to tell you, you know, that I have appreciated every one of you. And I want you to know that because I want you to remember not me or us. I want you to remember the one I serve, we serve. Because the Lord is everything. But if you don't know him, we are condemned. Please, please, please. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.